Sheila McElroy. Sheila is a faculty member in the Vector Institute and a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Toronto. Prior to joining the University of Toronto in 2004, uh, Sheila spent six years as a research scientist at Stanford University and one year at Xerox Park, which personally was a hero location for me, having led to a lot of the technology that you all use in your computers today. Uh, she is currently serving as the past president of KR Inc., the International Scientific Foundation concerned with fostering research and communication on knowledge representation and reasoning. Sheila is a fellow of the Association of the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence, an associate editor of the Journal of Artificial Intelligence Research, and serves on the editorial board of the Artificial Intelligence Magazine, and is past associate editor of the Journal of Artificial Intelligence. You got a well-seasoned expert here. Please let me uh, welcome Sheila. Thank you. Thank you, Garth, for the very nice introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I, I was you uh, 20 years ago, I think, and, and when I thought, like Marcus, about what I wanted to talk about, I thought I wanted to share some of my experiences and some of the road to, to getting to where I am today. So doing the right thing and getting your AI to do the same. I will talk a little bit about some of my research um, at the end or some things that I think will be impactful for you. But I wanted to start by, by talking about doing the right thing with your life, if there is such a right thing, and, and what really informed the choices that I've made, because I've had a really, really great career, and, and, and it's ongoing. So one of the things that has always informed me when, I, when, I, when I've thought about making choices and, and transitions in my life was really, who do I want to be? You know, what do I want to do with my life? What's important to me? And that, that will be different for all of you. Um, but it's a good question to ask yourself. So, I've had this very wiggly career path. Um, I did an undergraduate degree in math and stats. Um, I, I worked for my statistics professor. I, I took a computer course, which was very easy compared to the math, um, and, and worked, at, worked in the computer center. Um, and then I, I thought about going to grad school, but I really wanted to get, I was chomping to go out and travel and to work, and, and so that's what I did. And I went out and I worked for a period of time, and because I had a really great math background, I was given a really challenging problem to work on, and it, it opened my eyes to just how wonderful computer science was, because I hadn't studied computer science as an undergraduate. So I went back to and did a master's degree, met some wonderful friends who, I, who have been lifelong friends of mine, and, and again, I got a scholarship to do a PhD, and people were encouraging me to do a PhD. But again, I sort of thought, you know, there's a whole world out there. And so I, I traveled for a while. I ran out of money. I was in the UK. I got this great job doing AI work that, that ended up being, you know, just that, that small thing ended up opening the door to a really wonderful job where I worked at a research lab for a period of time doing industrial and applied AI research. And, and they ended up sending me back to do a, a, a PhD. I had a scholarship, but I also had this great gig where I was working on applied research projects while I was doing a PhD. But because I was paid to do a PhD, because I had been paid to do all these great things, I really wanted to do a PhD in something that I, no one would pay me to learn. And so I did a very theoretical PhD um, in knowledge representation and reasoning, and it opened my, my, my mind, or my, my, my uh, yeah, it opened my, my world to, to mathematics, to mathematical logic, and, and a whole different way of looking at AI than, than I had been looking at it before. I worked with a very famous research professor here at the University of Toronto, and, and it was an invaluable experience. At, but after I graduated, I still wasn't sure I wanted to go into academia. And of course, that was where a lot of my colleagues were going. I really thought I wanted to work in California and, and, and work at Xerox Park. Like Garth, I think I was really enamored with, 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 um, with Xerox Park. For those of you who've never heard of it, you can Google it later, but it's, it's a very famous research lab. And, and so I, I was working as a postdoc both at Xerox Park and Stanford, and then Stanford offered me a research scientist position. So I had a really great job there. I worked a lot with NASA on space systems. It was, it was just a wonderful journey. But eventually, my husband and I decided that we wanted to come back to Canada. And so I, I got a job at U of T and uh, got tenure, um, became a professor. I served as vice chair of the department for a period of time. And now I'm just, I'm on sabbatical now, which is just the best part of being a professor. And, um, and along the way, I had two kids. For those of you who are trying to think about work-life balance, that's, that's you know, an ongoing challenge for, for all of us. 
So how, how did I choose my career path? I, I really, uh, part of it was really knowing the type of person that I wanted to be, thinking about what I like to do, you know, how I, how I like to spend my days um, and what, what gives me pleasure, um, pursuing my passion for AI and for who I wanted to be, and also believing that what I wanted to do, I could probably do, but if it didn't work out, that that was gonna be okay as well, that it was okay to try and fail and, and to, to really pursue those passions. So how did I make it work? Um, you know, people always hate it when you say this, and it, it, particularly when women say this. Oh, how did it work? It's because of luck or serendipity or I was in the right place at the right time. And, and I think all of those things really are true to a certain extent, but it was also a lot of hard work. And, and I love this quote. Probably some of you have seen it before. It's, it's attributed to Thomas Jefferson. I'm a great believer in luck, and I find that the harder the wor I work, the more I have of it. It's true. You know, hard work is, really does get you uh, a lot of the way there. So, so did I make the right choices? Maybe, maybe not. I think I could have been happy in many different careers. You know, I'm in an academic now. I think I could have been very happy and could be very happy in an industrial setting as well. But, but there is no one choice. So when you're thinking about what you want to do, whether you want to go into academia, as some of you may aspire to continuing on and doing a PhD, and others may be thinking about going out and working in industry. Whoops. Oh, that doesn't look good. What happened here? I probably pressed the wrong button. Excuse me. Let's try this. Okay, good. Let's try this again. Oop. Oop. Oh, interesting. Let's see what happens now. Okay, don't move. Good. Okay. So, so there are pros and cons to industry and academia, and they, this is just my my personal reflections of some. You know, one of the great things about working in industry is that you get to work in a team with people who are sitting beside you here, and really great people. Um, there's potential for real impact, as as Marcus was talking about, and that's really meaningful to really say to look at something and to know that you've affected um, or bettered the lives, hopefully, of of, of hundreds of thousands of people. Often there's better work-life balance in, in, in industry, but not necessarily. Usually you have a boss, and, and they take responsibility for hiring more people if there's too much work to do, at least you hope so. The pay can be very good, at least right now it's, it's great. My graduate students all make more money than I do. Um, my graduated graduate students, my graduate students do not make more money than me, <laughs> fortunately, as you all know. Um, uh, the fun, but the problem with industry is that the fun doesn't always last. And, and I've been through several of what, what's referred to as these AI winters, where AI was hot and then it fell. And I've had friends who've had great jobs in industry um, or at industrial research labs where all of a sudden the, the companies decided to pivot. And you're no longer working on AI, you're working on you know, Twinkies or something, I don't know, some, some very different thing. And so, so that's the risk you take. And sometimes once you're in industry, it's hard, it's hard to move back. Um, there are varied career paths in industry. You may not want to stay as a tech person. You may want to go, you want, may want to become a manager. You may want to work in a variety of different areas. There's so much leeway if you work in industry, and probably you'll hear about some of the pathways this afternoon at the job fair. And there's departure and reentry. You know, people take leaves, they go away, they, they come and go, they go from one company back. One of my friends just went back to the company that she was working for before. She tried something else, didn't like it, and, and went back. In contrast, academia is like running your own little business. You know, I, I have no boss. I am the boss. Unfortunately, I am the boss, and I have no employees, really. I have a bunch of graduate students like you guys, that sometimes I can get them to do what I want them to do, but not always. And I feel committed and beholden in a way to, to, to advancing their careers. And so, so that's sometimes in contrast with getting things done that I want to do. I have no one that I can say, you know, gee, I've got way too much work to do. Can you please assign, you know, this to somebody? else. But the great thing about academia is that there's flexibility, there's job security, it pays well, and you really can make your own fun. It's, and, and, you know, learning and exploring, as, as I'm sure all of you appreciate as, as graduate students, is just one of the most wonderful gifts that you can, can, can have. So I feel really privileged to have the job that I have. Anyways, a very, very quick pieces of advice where Marcus and I are full of advice, and by the way, I agree with his, his advice wholeheartedly. Um, be generous with your time, with your citations for those of you who are writing papers. There's room at the top for everybody. Uh, pick, pick up the people beside you and all do a great job together. Don't feel like you have to step on people to get up to the top. Uh, get a mentor or at least a friend. It's a lot more fun to work with, with your friends. I, I, try to, I work a lot with, with people that I really just enjoy spending time with. 
be a mentor and a role model. It, you forget that even, even now you have a lot of accumulated knowledge and you can help the people who are coming up behind you. It's never too soon to, to start doing that. And remember that you can't do it all. So rec reflect in yourself about what you're good at. You know, you may really love to be the best, uh, I don't know, machine learning researcher who advances the mathematics of, of machine learning. But if that's not your skill set, then maybe that's not what you should be aspiring to do. So recognize what you can do. And, and remember that science is social. I think to Marcus's point about, about the wedding, um, you know, science is everywhere, and, and it isn't necessarily the person who does the best work who wins in the end. It's, it, you know, sh get to know your, your researchers, get to know the people beside you. Some of these people will probably be heads of companies in, in a few years, so, so keep that in mind. What I wanted to spend the, 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 the minutes that I have left doing um, is just talking a little bit about doing the right thing with respect to AI and getting your AI to do the same. So I, I'm not going to talk about my research, but I, what I wanted to talk about is, is something that you're probably hearing a lot more about in, in, in the news, which is the notion of AI safety. So AI is everywhere, from, uh, from toasters to Teslas. You know, if, if there's AI in your toothbrush, apparently, and, and in your vacuum cleaner, and in your bagel in the morning, um, a lot of it's a marketing scam. Um, but it is indeed the case that with the proliferation of, of sensors, um, that, that we really do have a lot of data. And it really does provide an opportunity for us to use uh, AI techniques to improve the, the products that are being pro uh, produced in industry. But one of my area of research is sequential decision making. I like to look at, at how to make decisions over time in order to affect change. And it's, that's a pretty scary thing to unleash on the world. So our, our AIs are making more and more decisions that impact a large number of people. And, and we as technologists, we as the people on the front line should be beholden. We understand how these systems work and we should be beholden to making sure that we're doing a good job. So how do we ensure that our AI will do the right thing or, and make good decisions? And what does it even mean to, to, to do the right thing or to have a good decision? or to make a good decision. If you read it all in the popular press, you'll hear all these different words um, bandied about that, that AI should be fair and equitable, moral, unbiased, rational, principled, transparent, accountable, and explainable. And all those things are true, and they probably mean something to you at some level, and they mean different. It's interesting that I have colleagues who are philosophers and, and colleagues who are statisticians, and even the notion of fairness or, or bias means many different things to many different people. So even understanding what we mean by doing the right thing is a challenge to us as researchers. So I created this big list of desiderata for decision makers and, and for decision making systems. And, and you can see it here. Uh, I, those are a lot of things that, that, that I, I mentioned on the previous page. But I think, um, and not all of them hold true to every particular system. Not every system can explain uh, why, how it does what it does, and, and I, I've said this before, but you know, if I, I, I see friends of mine in the audience, but, but can I explain to you how, how I recognize them? Maybe I can give you some post hoc explanation that, that my friend has blonde hair or that, that, uh, um, or that, that he's uh, five foot ten, but, but that may not be what my brain was doing when, when I actually recognized him. That's a post hoc explanation that maybe will satisfy you, but it doesn't explain what's going on inside this box that, that happens to be my head. So, so a lot of times we actually can't achieve some of these things, and in other cases they don't really matter. It doesn't, you know, I don't, I don't require my robot to explain why it put a particular force on, on, its, on its end effector in order to pick up uh, the, the cup of coffee to hand it to me. Um, so what can we expect from our AI systems? Do we expect our AI systems to do as well as us? Will we hold our AI systems to higher standards than we hold ourselves? Um, this is a quote from Stuart Russell, and I, I actually really liked it, you know, close, but, but I've made the Canadian version of it. Close to 3,000 people are killed in motor vehicle accidents in Canada every year, um, more than 10 times that number in, in the United States. So if we build autonomous cars and we reduce the, the mortality rate from motor vehicle accidents by, by 50%, do you think we we'll, you know do you think GM or or some other company will uh, uh, or Uber will be receiving uh, thank you notes from those those uh, that 50 those 1500 people who uh, whose lives were saved probably they're going to get uh, lawsuits from the 1500 who who were killed even though we've reduced the the uh, the mortality rate relative to to what's going on now
now. So in some ways, we have to ask ourselves how, what sort of standard we're going to hold our AI to. We've been building safety critical systems for years. So, so you know, when I think about it from a, as somebody who's been working in these areas for a long time, I've built NASA space systems and various other things. We have, we have uh, you know, our traffic lights that we all blast through at 60 miles an hour when they're green are controlled by computers. And we all have faith in those systems working. So, so what's the big deal with AI? Well, the problem is that with AI, um, the systems are only as good as the models or the data. And sometimes the models are really hard, to, are really easy to produce, even to do amazing things. So I, I've, I've long been a, a lover of space. And, and again, I, I worked, um, did some projects with NASA for periods of time. And it's actually interesting to think that, that, that when you fly into outer space, it's actually a lot easier than, than, than walking down the street. If you, it, it seems in, counterintuitive in some ways, but, but we understand the physics, we can write the models, we can test them, and we can do a really great job. Whereas just, and, and so we can write models for things like this, whereas writing models for things like this, let's see what this works, um, is, is hard. Imagine trying to model a system. This is, this is such a great video because I'm, I'm, look at the pedestrians walk crossing the street, it just scares me to think about it. Anyway, yeah. If we can do that with AI, we'll be in good business. So we may or may not be able to build models. And of course, the, 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 the machine learning answer to that is that, that we're going to just get the data and figure things out from data. But even getting the right data, to, to Marcus's point, is, is, is really hard. Getting, getting to the point where you actually have clean data that's going to allow you to do the types of predictions that, that you want to be able to do or develop policies for acting in the world is really, really hard. And, and it isn't just about the models or the data. For those of you who read AI in the popular press, you've, you've probably seen this headline or something like it before. You know, should a driverless car kill the kid or the retiree? Um, AI is going to have to make very important decisions, just as we do every day in our lives. And, and that's really about, uh, and, and it's going to make decisions based upon what we tell it it should be doing. So for those of you who are, who are along in your studies, you've probably learned about reinforcement learning. One of the ways that we build, these, we build systems that decide how to act in the world is by training systems through experience to, to maximize expected cumulative reward. So we, we, the, uh, an agent operates in the environment trying to get positive reward for some things and negative reward for other things. You know, my, at, at home, I'm running this, this, uh, this very small uh, study um, uh, to get my kids to, like, please, when they're getting ice cream, to please open the freezer, take the, the ice cream out, serve themselves ice cream, uh, but then not stop there, put the ice cream back in the freezer and close the door. It seems to be a very, very difficult uh, reinforcement learning problem because they haven't seemed to be able to master it yet. But, but there are lots. How do you tell your computer how to do that when, when as, as those of you who've built reinforcement learning systems, you know that, that basically you're just describing a mapping from a state to some sort of scalar value. So it's really hard to even envision how we, we actually can, can tell our machines what we wanted them to do. And this is referred to as the agent alignment problem. How do we create agents that behave in accordance with users' intention? And the problem is, as, as, as many of you will, will, I think, understand, if you don't talk about a particular variable, if you don't, you know, if I don't say that it's important not to kill anybody or, or to run over my toes, then your system will optimize for what you've asked it to do by varying all the other parameters in whatever way is necessary in order to optimize. So if I say I want a Starbucks coffee right now, you know, you'll, my, my, and I don't say much else, my system will plow through, uh, you know, knocking people over, you know, and to get to that coffee and to get it to me as quickly as possible. So we really need to understand how to give common sense to our systems, and, and in some ways, some form of humanity. So this is often referred to as a value alignment problem. AI systems should be designed so that their goals and behaviors can be assured to align with human values throughout their operation. Um, until we figure this out, and even afterwards, I think we have to proceed with caution. You understand how these systems work, and, and, and you know, the burden is on you to, to you know, to advocate for technology, but also to be good stewards of the technology that we are building. 
Um, it isn't all doom and gloom. You know, I think industry is taking a leadership role in really taking, recognizing that these issues exist around ethical AI, around safe AI. And there are all sorts of really exciting, ish, uh, exciting initiatives that are taking, taking place. These are, are some of the lists of things. You know, IBM has a everyday ethics for AI. Uh, Microsoft has a, an ether panel that, that checks all of its products before they go out to make sure that they are, are, are ethical in nature. There's, there's a lot going on and more that you'll see in the coming years. These are the sorts of things that you can advocate for when you're working in, in corporations and, 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 or, or set up something similar to this, a model like this, wherever it is that you're working. So what can you do? Be engaged. Engage yourself and your comp companies in ethical use of AI. Educate, help clients and your boss and your bosses understand the strengths and limitations of the technology you're building. I think a lot of people marvel at these boxes that we can build and they don't understand that the box only works in this setting. It only works with this particular piece of data, uh, this particular set of data. There's a lot in the news right now in, 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 in the medical sector about you know, biased data or that, that data has not been, been for example, um, collected for, for female patients as opposed to male patients. Understand the applicability of your technology. You will know that, but the person that you're delivering the box to may not. And also speak up. Um, you know what your code is doing. Even the best intentioned boss won't know what, what data sets you used and, and what algorithms you necessarily used or what corners you took uh, to make things work or to, or to meet a deadline. And so it's important for you to feel empowered to, to speak up and to advocate for, you know, to, to talk about the limitations of your, your, your work. Uh, um, for those of you, I, I, I think back to Cambridge Analytics in particular, and, and of course, a lot of people took a, a lot of guff for, for what happened with the, the misuse of data. But, but I thought, you know, Part of, and, and the, 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 the heads of the companies took responsibility, but, but it was also that there were coders there who may not have felt empowered to say something, even if they felt that what they were doing or the data that they were using or the way that they were using the data was perhaps inappropriate. So, so speak up, because you're the ones who know what's going on in the bottom, on the, the, the ground floor. So, uh, Think about who you want to be. I think Garth alluded to this and, and Marcus as well. You, you, are this, you are in a great place at a very exciting time. You have the opportunity to create the future. When I read the newspaper in the morning, I'm just struck by, by all the, the important things that we need to do to, to make sure that we have a great um, future for ourselves, for our children, and for our grandchildren. And I think you have the skills to be able to affect that change. So I just want to um, encourage you all to do that. And have fun. You're at a great place. So thank you.